All right, the March 15th meeting of the Rockport School Committee is now in session. This meeting will be broadcast live and recorded for later broadcast. Approval of minutes from February 15th, 23. Um, I believe we were all here for that. Does anyone have any amendments to those meetings, meeting notes or corrections to those notes? No. All right, do I have a motion to approve the meetings of February 15th? Sorry, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of the meeting from February 15th? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. Public comment. I don't believe we have anyone who wishes to make a comment tonight, so we'll move on to correspondence. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So in your uh, drive, there were three uh, pieces of information. I uh, obviously won't read all, every one of them, but I'll give you a quick commercial on all of them. Um, I included the MASC policy newsletter from March. Um, I felt that this was just an important uh, validation, so to speak, for all of us to just say, listen, this is their, their March update. <laughs> they gave us a, what, four or five page list of policies that they're tearing through, um, which just tells me I feel good about spending the money and partnering with them on, on the work they're doing for us because if they can find this many in a typical year or even in a typical winter cycle to look at, um, it, it does make you a little fearful for what they will and won't find when they do full reviews of districts like ours. Um, so that's really the only reason it's in here, just to give everybody an understanding that they are really on top of their policy work as an organization. Um, they have found a whole bunch that they're looking at. Um, and most importantly is every time a legal update happens, they're right on top of the legal updates in a way that a lot of local school committees just can't always, uh, can't always do it. So. Um, I have not heard from Dorothy since our last meeting. I do know that she told me it would take potentially two to three months to comb through everything. Um, I will give her an email between now and the next meeting and maybe come back to you with some kind of updated timeline so that the subcommittee will know. Um, I do anticipate the subcommittee work ramping up as soon as I get that email from her, um, and she'll take one, one policy section at a time. Um, so that's really the, the purpose for that one, Mr. Chair. Um, the second one came in from NEASC um, to Principal Rose just to formally let us know about our NEASC accreditation cycle. Um, so as you can see, when you took a look, we've been designated for a 2026 school. Um, so that means that our accreditation visit will begin in 26, but uh, if you've been through this before, we have some prep work to do uh, around the new vision for learning accreditation process. Um, so there'll be some, some site visits, there'll be a collaborative conference in 2024, and the important work is that next year, it used to be called the self-study, it's now called the self-reflection. And so what's going to happen uh, next year is the school will be in its self-reflection period, and we will go through an entire uh, self-reflection process guided by them, um, and I will make sure that Principal Rose gives periodic updates throughout the school year next year so that everybody knows how that process is going, and then we'll have our full visit um, in 2026. A lot of the work will be around the portrait of a graduate and setting up um, our program and, and make and some of the program of studies moves we've already made will be very helpful, quite honestly, to the work ahead of us. Um, so we are excited to dig into the portrait of a graduate work. We're even having conversations about portrait of a faculty um, and, and blending those two concepts um, and really making sure we can kind of put ourselves on the map for 2026. And then it the seems like yesterday that we finished the work in the last accreditation. It's, it's an enormous amount of activity. So Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a heavy lift every time you go through it, right? Every time you, it doesn't seem to be less or easier. Um, it is a pretty daunting opportunity for us to really take a good look at ourselves. But the timing's right. You know, first year superintendent comes in, we make a lot of moves. Um, we have a new budget process going through. We've got some good initiatives. So I, I actually think the timing's probably pretty healthy for the district. Um, and it'll be exciting for us to do some work with the new leadership team over my first two years and see how that kind of tees us up um, for the process in, in 26. Uh, the third communication comes from... Um, M-A-S-S. -S. This is uh, Mar Dr. Mary Bork, our Director of Government Affairs, um, was on the Hill, so to speak, um, giving an update uh, on basically, a it's a pretty thick amount of advocacy around the budget, around um, areas of focus that they would like uh, the budget to, to, to handle. Um, some of it around fulfilling the promise of education, around uh, ed reform, around circuit breaker. Um, they'd like to talk about, they formally asked about the supplemental budget to hold districts harmless from the 14%. Clearly no, dis no formal decisions have been made yet. There are budgets 
out there right now uh, from the governor's side. There's going to be budgets coming from uh, the legislature side. Um, but I, as I've said multiple times in these meetings, it's really important that the community understands the amount of advocacy that's happening um, and how we are really putting um, our best foot forward to make sure we're being um, forthright with, with our needs. I will tell you that Dr. Bork is unbelievable. She, you know, is a longtime superintendent from Chelsea um, and has an unbelievable reputation. She's a leader, leader, leader at MASS. Um, along with uh, Tom Scott and Chris McGrath. So they put us in really good positions. But Mary does a lot of heavy lifting around the legislative work for us and sends out regular updates to the school uh, superintendents just so that we're in a loop on all that. Um, and I really feel like I've never known more about what's going on at the state level than I have um, in the years that Mary's been involved with the organization. So thank you to Mary, to MASS, um, and just so that the public knows that the advocacy work continues. And I do think MASS has a seat at the table. Um, I really do, and, and, and this, the North Shore Superintendents Roundtable, I have been extremely impressed to be part of. I've been a part of a couple roundtables now in the state um, during my time as a leader, and um, they are a forward-thinking, proactive group, and uh, to be the rookie in the room is really humbling, and, and it's, a, it's a quick learning curve to be part of that team. So a lot of advocacy on the North Shore, a lot of advocacy from our organizations, um, and my hope is that we'll see some uh, fruits of our labor you know, as the budget moves forward. Right. Personnel. I don't see anything in the folder, so none is this, at this time. If none at this time, share the success, Josh. That would be your student advisory council. It's my turn. Look at that. <laughs> All right. I just want to say real quickly. I think this is a really well put together packet. But, um, go I'm sure we'll get soon. to that later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll start with things that are going to be mentioned across all three updates. Uh, it's spring, which is lovely and great, and it means that it's not dark outside all the time, which I love. Um, <laughs> uh, there's the art show going on downtown. Um, it opened eesh, last night or the night before. I don't know. A couple nights ago, they had music playing. They have art from across all three schools. It's lovely. I haven't gotten the chance to go down there yet, but if you um, you know, if you have an opportunity, you should go down. It's at the Art Association downtown. Um, and uh, since we have last met, there's been the Great Marsh performances. There's been um, a jazz competition at the high school um, where the group won bronze. And there has been uh, the DECA competition where our school went to regionals and then went to states. And they performed pretty well at states, um, but unfortunately did not move on to the national competition. Um, the, uh, there's the National Art Society, uh, National Art Honor Society, which is also at the, um, at the art show. Uh, there was the Great Marsh performances, which I'm seeing here actually sold out. I didn't know that. Um, uh, and there was the Drama Fest competition, which occurred over the weekend. Um, and the Rockport High School, the Rockport High School Drama Fest will be, uh, the Drama Fest, which wrote their own play. They'll be moving on to the regionals, which... I don't know if it's in Boston or somewhere else. I think this weekend. This weekend? Boston. This weekend? And this is Boston? Yeah. Okay. And over. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we'll be heading towards Boston eventually. All right. So <laughs> starting from the bottom up, we have the elementary school um, where the principal has making rounds and classroom visits, um, and the third graders have been working on their narrative essays, which I think is the cutest thing ever. Um, <laughs> uh, they also have their um, – uh, report cards which have gone home. So if you're an elementary school parent, make sure to look out for those. Um, my parents are talking about it. <laughs> Hopefully all good things. I don't know. Um, at the uh, middle school level, uh, they uh, took their uh, annual ski club trip to, um, oh, where'd they go? Uh, they went to uh, Bradford over the course of the season, but I think they go up to New Hampshire. I don't know. I went the other year. It was great. Um, you know, Mr. Fauci does a great job taking them through that. Um, and the eighth graders are, uh, you know, well into their course selection along with the rest of the high school. Um, and then over at the high school, um, like I said, there's the National Art Honor Society, which has had their inductions and their displays and all that. Um, winter sports finished up and they had their... Um, they had their like award banquet or ceremonies and um, that opens up spring sports so if there's anyone who would like to register for spring sports they should uh, get on that <laughs> um, yeah and other than that looking forward um, it's almost done there's almost graduation so be on the lookout for that don't, don't rush it don't yeah. rush it, yeah. don't rush it. <laughs> I'm trying I'm trying not to I'm um, just to piggyback on that a little bit, Mr. Chair. The uh, yeah, the, the high school jazz program earned a, bron a bronze 
Um, and I was fortunate enough to drive out to Reading last week for that. Um, they played very well, represented Rockport with pride. Um, a lot of talented musicians across the state. And once again, you know, we go out into those kind of settings all the time and really hold our own and represent well. And um, the theater program um, continues to just take names at this point. Like they go out and they, they just they win, and they win again. And to do that with an original piece on top of it is really, really yeah. impressive. So um, good luck to them as they move forward this weekend. Um, and we, we hope that they have continued success too. So the, the fine arts continues to impress um, at a lot of levels. And, and again, the, the concerts have been stellar. Um, so it's sold out concerts and collaborations with Endicott College. Uh, we're very, very fortunate to have yeah. the partnerships that we have. At the Seeing them at both the, was it North Andover or North Reading, the size of the stage mm. that our kids went from, from our stage to one that large, and to see them on the stage of the Shailen Lou. I mean, not only does it show how much flexibility our performing artists have, but such a great opportunity to really stretch their muscles. And it was impressive. Both shows were just really amazing. Thank you, Josh. That was wonderful. Subcommittee reports. Do we have any? Okay, well, that brings up. Uh, communications update, social so media presence. We continue to uh, do a lot of work around our communication uh, planning. Um, and so we're sort of implementing this little backwards design here. So we're doing a lot of updates and changes throughout the course of the year. And then that will uh, result in an, a kind of an end of the year update from me with a more formalized plan. Um, but we really, as I was saying off camera a few minutes ago, we're trying to make a lot of changes in real time uh, so that we can be more transparent and more uh, forthcoming with the community in a lot of different ways. So our technology team, uh, Monty and Mike, have worked really hard to support us in this work. Um, we have partnered with this company called Sendable, and it's, for lack of a better term, it's, a, it's an aggregator basically that will allow us, us to send out um, posts through Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram all through one program. Um, so it's, it's allowing, it's much more efficient, it's allowing us to send one clean message out at the same time. So. Uh, Mike Montgomery pulled together a training uh, with all of the uh, administrative team members as well as our admin assistants, and I think that was about a week ago, gave us a real good crash course in Sendable. Um, so we, on the next page, I will show you that we have uh, up upgraded all of our social media presences. We have also added a district LinkedIn page so that we can really work on our professional profile when it comes to trying to hire and retain high quality staff. Um, so we'll be putting um, district needs out through LinkedIn, maybe some PR materials through LinkedIn as well, as in just a little bit of a different professional setting than you can on the other uh, social media platforms. Um, on this slide, just some this, these all came, by the way, from Mike's presentation, so none of this is my original artwork and design, clearly, based on past slides you've seen from me. Um, so uh, this is uh, just kudos to, to, to Mike for putting some good work together. So uh, we had a long conversation about branding and, and about, again, putting our best foot forward as a district. Um, our, our postings will now have QR codes on them, so when they go out, they'll, you'll be able to get hard copies, you'll be able to get digital copies, you'll be able to take a snapshot with a QR code. That'll push right uh, to our uh, SchoolSpring accounts where all of our jobs are posted, and we're having conversations about posting positions, specifically non-teaching positions, on other platforms as well, other than LinkedIn, and finding out where people are looking for non-teaching positions, because if you're a non-educator looking for a, a different type of job in the school district, you're probably not looking at SchoolSpring. Right. Um, you're looking at one of the other two or three major players, um, as well as uh, Gloucester Times. So uh, we're going across platforms. We had a conversation about the power of hashtags if you live in the social media world and how people are really searching on hashtags. And kids, uh, and I mean kids and anybody younger than 50, I guess, uh, they're, all, um, they're all searching through hashtags. And sometimes I see posts that have more hashtags than actual English language in them. Um, so we're, we're really talking about leveraging hashtags as a way that you as a community will be able to search on our hashtag and find all things RPS. So you'll see that um, on our next slide. Um, trying to be consistent with the logo uh, with the Viking until we have a, uh, an updated one or anything different for, through branding. And then we're trying to be c consistent with our message across all of our platforms. One of the cool things that happens with this new product is it gives us engagement data which we've never been able to do before. So we'll be able to take a look and see how many people are checking us out on Facebook, how many people we're hitting on Instagram, how many we're hitting on Twitter. 
um, like we already get that information off our website. So I think over time, it won't be instantaneous, but over time I'll be able to get some really good information around engagement um, that will give us quantifiable data around which tools people are using, what age brackets are using them, um, and, and you know which types of messages do they want on certain platforms. Might, might be an interesting um, conversation as well. And then we did talk about being inclusive with our flow of information. The website, which is the home for all news and calendar, is um, not an intrusive thing. You have to go to the website. Right. So we're not forcing you onto a social media platform. Not everybody wants to be engaged in certain products. So the website has to be our best foot forward. That's why Mike is continuing to do the redesign. Um, and when we feel like it's close to done, then we'll have a, a more true reveal here. But if you're on it, you'll see little tweaks across the way almost every week or so now. Um, after that, then we come to the sendable route, which goes out to our three or four platforms. Um, we continue to use Blackboard as our communication with parents. That's how we send out all of our weekly updates, snow messages, that kind of stuff goes through our Blackboard. And then ultimately, we can't forget that still people still want hard copies. They want to see stuff in the newspaper. They might every now and then be a real good reason to have flyers um, and, and a paper product. So we want to make sure we're hitting um, our stakeholders uh, at, at at, at their point of entry, so to speak, when it comes to communication. So it was a really good session, um, and in a minute you're going to see that we've already used the product for the, the Snow Day tweets and the Snow Day Instagrams and stuff that went out, um, as well as some good PR work the other night with concerts. Um, so really thanks to Monty and Mike for supporting us as a tech team. Thank you to the administrative team, by the way, um, and the admin support team for taking a leap of faith. Um, one of the things we're talking about in our leadership team meeting is um, – just diving in with two feet. You know, not everybody has the same skill set or um, belief system when it comes to social media in general. And, you know, when when the company, so to speak, says, listen, we're, we're diving in with both feet because we have to meet people where they are, um, we have to recognize that that's a learning curve and a skill set and a philosophical shift for some people. So the, the leadership team and the, and the admin assistant team has really embraced the work, and I think we will get better and better at it as the months go on, and hopefully the community will benefit from that. Um, and recognize the work that we're doing. This slide will talk you through some of the new changes. So we have an elementary school, a high school, and a middle school Facebook page. Some schools had them but weren't using them. Others didn't have them at all. So now um, they're going to be out there, and we will start to build our presence. We have rebranded all the Twitter accounts so that they're consistent, so that you don't get lost in the Twitter sphere, so to speak. So everything is RKPT. RKPT say that five times. RKPT, so it's the little, uh, you know, little bumper sticker on the back of your car. Um, and that'll be our Twitter and our Instagram handle, and then it's underscore PSHS. So you'll see um, even mine um, is going to shift, so I'll stop tweeting from the, the Mark Branco account soon, and I will shift to the public school account. The other reason we've done this is I've studied. Um, I actually went to a, the MASC, MASS conference. In, was that the session you and I were in together, right, with the communications director? And they talked about... Um, historical relevance of your of your uh, social media presence. So when a principal moves on, when an athletic director moves on, when a superintendent moves on, um, if that's all connected to the personal profile, uh, there's some historical loss sometimes there. Um, so by us doing it this way, um, there there is some historical relevance there. And then those of us still using personal accounts can always retweet the district account for our own purposes. Um, so this is the list here, and then the LinkedIn is there. And our new hashtag for everybody who wants to follow is right there, hashtag RKPTVikings, all capitals up to the V. Um, and so we're going to put this out to faculty and staff over the next couple of weeks too because we have a ton of faculty, staff, coaches, uh, class advisors. Um, we even have students that have their own side accounts um, connected to, uh, to some of our work. And so we're going to hope that people embrace that hashtag across all platforms so that if you're out there in the public trying to search us up and find stuff, you can just use the hashtag and really kind of pull everything together in one place. And, Mark, what is the thought towards communicating these new addresses to parents? So, How do they find out? Yeah, so I have my s'more update half-drafted. The hope is to put it out on the first day of spring, which is, what, Monday, I think, oh. if I'm correct. Um, so I, my hope is to send out a mm -hmm. nice... Superintendent's newsletter on Monday, welcome to spring, and to have a big section around communication and budget because I think they haven't really heard, they've heard in this format, but I want to make sure everybody hears uh, formally what's been going on with the budget. So I'll have a big budget update section, I'll have a communications update session, maybe some accolades around uh, some of the stuff the students have been doing. Um, so my hope is to get that out Monday. Great. When you, <coughs> when you send out <coughs> a notice of... Um, and you talk about sendable being like this, um, the big umbrella. Yep. 
Like, talk about the um, the way that it went with the with the early release day. Do you, if you want to send out one notice, does it go through? Do you do it once and it goes yeah. through all the yeah. Instagram, Facebook? So you'll see that I actually updated this slide deck from the first version I just shared with you because mm -hmm. I wanted you to see what happened on the snow day. Um, so basically what happens on, on that kind of a day is after I make the decision and, and I let the right people know, um, Miss Osher lets the newspapers and TV know, and then um, Mike Montgomery takes the lead as our communications director, and he, uh, I, I send out the uh, you get my voicemail and my email. That comes from me. Uh, through the typical system, and then Mike grabs my messages through a shared doc, and he blasts it out through Sendable, which goes out to all the social media platforms. Yeah. Um, and then internally, principals send out emails to the faculty in case they miss you, You're email. essentially doing it once through once. Sendable, yeah. and then it, it spreads it out yeah. amongst everything. Yeah, it's really nice. Cool. Yeah, it's really nice. So, you know, and again, we're, we're learning. Um, so we've learned some, some unique differences. You know, some have um, limitations around... Uh, amount of text you can put in there and others don't um instagram is really picture driven so you have to make sure there's a picture in it which is not true about twitter um and facebook you know you can post ad nauseum um so you know we're, we're working throughout those kinks now but generally speaking yeah if somebody's at a concert and principal rose wants to send a nice message about something that happened to the shade they can take one picture do it through the sendable app right. and then It'll go she can populate all the products at once nice. it's pretty cool yeah and what about you mentioned branding a little bit with the logos yep. and and um, the QR codes and whatnot. Yep. So in terms of the branding and the logos and the photo and sort of the overall sort of I don't know if it's really called a mission statement, but yep. and, and on the buses even on this on the vans, yep. there's yep. a couple of phrases. Is all that being looked at? And if so, when do you yes. think you might come back to us with? So Some all all that becomes part of the strategy for district improvement, which after we finish this, the, the um, entry plan findings tonight, if you remember, that's phase three. Okay. So the first phase part is data collection. The second part is the dissemination of the information. And then the leadership team and I, with the help of other stakeholders, between basically April 1st and the first day of school, we'll work on that. We'll hope to have phase a three. full... It's, it used to be called the strategic plan, right? Yeah. So ho hopefully to have a strategy for district improvement. And some of that won't be finished. The plan will be finished. But there will be – some of that work is delicate in communities. When you talk about branding, when you talk about logos, when you talk about mascots, all of that stuff is interesting, right? So um, conversations are, you know, I'm not – please make sure no one's hearing this incorrectly. We're not talking about getting rid of a Viking necessarily. What we're talking about is does the district have a different brand versus our athletic presence some districts have two separate things. Um, so we'll have good conversations around all that work, and, and the community will be part of those uh, visioning sessions as well. Right. Yep. Good. It's really nice to see it all coordinated yeah, it is. like this because often your social media presence just kind of grows <coughs> organically, and after a while, as we were experiencing different aspects of the school, we're sending out messages that were close but not exactly coordinated. We're also going through an approval process now that's kind of new to the district as well. So uh, Mike had put out an all call. He's going to put a last one up um, as we do more of this work, asking anybody, any employee who's using any media. So maybe we have art teachers that are, you know, making one up middle school in, middle school art Instagram account or you know a Twitter page for the band program or something like that that the teachers are running. We want to make sure all of those are actually formally approved if you're putting yourself out there to represent your company. So that will go through Mike. Mike will put together a spreadsheet. I will be privy to the spreadsheet. And in real time, those will become approved. Um, there's a lot of good reasons for that to happen, obviously. Right. Um, so uh, it's really a protection for the district more than anything else um, and the employees. Um, so that all, um, all of that is in place now. Mike started that work a couple months ago when we knew we were going in this direction. Um, and that's just so that you know that behind the scenes we're looking at a kind of a more formalized structure. To, so we want to encourage... <coughs> Again, we want to encourage technology use and social media and um, open lines of communication, but we need to do that in a safe and approved way. Yeah, when you talk about the open lines of communication, I feel like oftentimes we talk about um, more one-way communication in terms of right. giving information to parents and families yeah. or the community, yeah. but not always a way to receive information. Yeah. So is it that being looked at as well, how yep. to gather information? Yeah, I don't well? want to. Yeah, I don't want to give do up that? too much right now because some of this will be revealed later. But some of the things that I think some of these conversations that you and I were in in that session, where you saw a lot of superintendents, maybe a little older than me and a more more uh, beat up than me, so to speak, um, turtled when this happened. But the consultant in our session talked about 
if you're going to um, if you're going to use uh, social media and, and Facebook and you're not going to allow the comments, you might as well just have a website because social media by definition is social. And so you suddenly you saw a lot of people in the room go. So we're having those conversations about what that looks like as far as two-way communication. Some districts and, and, and companies particularly have explored um, the virtual anonymous suggestion box, right? It was, it was one way to do it or um, reverse communications to a principal that comes through a filter um, in a unique way or a more, more Google Form surveys that are open-ended, that kind of stuff. Um, so we're going to look at all of it and sort of take baby steps, I think, because it is that, is that is a new – this. This is a lot of work, but it's sort of culturally ingrained in, in society, whereas that, um, you know, there's, there's a lot going on when it comes to the toxicity, toxicity of the way we are communicating right now in, in right. general in, in the world. And so I want to make sure that we're doing If we set up a two-way communication, that we're doing it well. So I wonder, looking at this, maybe this is a question for this group, if it might be helpful when this is in place or even as it evolves for Mike Montgomery to have like a just a quick one sheet that tells parents right. the platforms and access points for you electronically are you know right. if you want report card information you go here right. course selection is here so a bunch of them would right. be in the student platform but then some of the social media platforms they have kind of a comprehensive picture of where am I supposed to go or what am I supposed to attach to right um, you know, and I wonder in a similar way if a, a similar sheet might be useful to students so mm -hmm. that there's not a loss of, I mean, I, I see it a lot at the college level where there's a lot of confusion about where do I go for the right. syllabus? Where right. are my assignments? They're not always consistently applied. And I'm sure, you know, parents having busy lives may not grasp or keep at top of mind, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to go out and if I want to see those tweets, you know, follow um, – Rockport Vikings consistently, but that that might be a help, or it might even be something on the the front page of our website, yeah. just yeah. connection points for parents. I think others. I think both one on the website and two when we talk about completing a, a communication plan, we've talked as a leadership team along with Mike that less is really more. So if we right. can come up with a one page that's a graphic, very gra simple, that's right. graphic driven. You know, uh, something as simple as, you know, if you're a parent and you have to communicate with your school about X, this is this is your first point of entry. You know, start with the teacher, then go to the office, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as well as here are all of our digital platforms. Here are two-way tools. Here are tools that are more for students versus parents. Here are community ones. So I, I think we're, we're trying to figure out can we make it in some kind of infographic so there's not a ton of language on it. Right. Um, which would be really nice, a one one pager that then gets you know PDF'd or duplicated on the website. So, um, I think that's what we actually envision the communication plan to be, not twenty pages right. of a communication right. plan. Yeah. Just right. Go under. Yeah. Yeah, something like that third or fourth page of the um, budget book yes. this year, where it's just highlights yes. of the school district. Yes. Similar. That sounds great. And the thing about them kind of all pushing out the same message is that's the other message is you don't have to follow Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. Correct. Pick your platform. Correct and you will get the information. I think that's what we did here at that session was to give people choices. They want to be device agnostic and product agnostic. And that's, right. that's kind of where we are right now. I think that's great that we're pu if we're pushing on a consistent message, you can hit whatever is your favorite and, yep. and get all the information you need. May I, uh, may I suggest a link tree? It's uh, kind of what you just described. Yeah. It's its own thing, it's like its own um, platform yeah. where you just have one link right. and then you click on that and it takes you to your own page that you can design and you can right. make look pretty right. and you put all of the other links to everything else in that one, in that one yeah. page yeah. so yeah. Um, I don't know we use it a lot for Mazer we have one link yeah. that goes to our other nine websites and those are super helpful for the people carrying phones yeah right. that's what we've yeah. learned with the QR codes that's what that's why we've tried to talk as a leadership team when we send our newsletters out through the s'mores to try not to embed PDFs anymore and to have hyperlinks embedded in them because most of us are reading in the hand and so when you do that you don't want to open up a PDF turn your phone side for those of us with old eyes yeah. turn the phone sideways expand it right you're better off just hitting that link and having it open up um, so yeah we're, we're gonna play with some kind of hyperlink or some kind of live document um, yeah that'll work thank you that's it's looking great and obviously a lot of work. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. When we're done with the website, I just want to talk about something else real quick. Okay.
Off you go. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> my brain doesn't always remember, so I'm trying to. My, we did have another. Um, we had our first meet and greet. Yes. Um, at Brothers Brew on the day of the snowstorm. So it was very quiet in Brothers Brew, and I only had like one or two visitors that came over to talk to me about school stuff. A lot of people in there that I knew that we could chit chat, but um, it was very positive, um, some honest feedback, you know, but it was good. People appreciated us being there on a very quiet day. I have about six <laughs> budget booklets left if anybody wants them for the next couple of things I mean it was interesting people did take them so and I'll talk about when it reached school committee business I can give an update on the um the other sessions if you want all right so I think unless there are other comments this will lead us into the much anticipated <laughs> superintendent's report of entry findings <clears throat> so I know you've had it Oop, I'm off. Yeah, sorry I know you've had it for a little while now um, so my intent tonight for the public is just to it's here. Um, we're going to do the same thing that we did with the budget book. It's going to be on the website tomorrow. We'll make hard copies. It'll be available in the office. We'll drop off hard copies here in the library, and we'll drop off hard copies at the town hall. Um, so we'll try to make all that happen. The website will go live tomorrow. The copies will probably take about a day or so to get out there. Um, so just so the community hears that tonight. And then what I'll do tonight is I'll kind of scroll through this as our guiding doc since you've had it. I'll, I'd like to highlight a couple bullets maybe on each section that kind of jumped out at me or either validated what we all seem to think or that, that jumped out in a way that um, we need to t take pause. And then after maybe either it per section, then I'll stop. And then if you want to hit me with thoughts, questions, comments about each of the three theme sections, that might be the easiest way to go through it. Um, since I was doing data representation, I told the chair this is my data representation of the student. So this is one student from every single grade, uh, pre-K, uh, all the way up. Leo is my favorite down in his, in his uh, I think his Spider-Man jammies or whatever. Ba Batman, sorry, Leo, <laughs> Batman. Um, so thank you to the students uh, who came down and maybe didn't even know what they were actually posing for. Uh, so that was much appreciated that we got them, get them in the shot. I know the high school kids, it was just uh, 10 minutes out of class and they were very excited uh, to come down. Um, uh, and I found this Parker Palmer quote, which I think is fascinating and timely for this kind of work, just to remind us that um, part of moving a community forward is you need to listen to everybody. And that really was my goal, and it will continue to be my, my goal. Um, right up until three days ago, I met with uh, a stakeholder in the community who, who's uh, got a lot to offer. Um, he's lived a long life and, and come into our community in the past so many years and um, really wanted his voice to be heard and missed an opportunity to do this. Um, so uh, as I told him and as I told everybody else that, that even though the formal entry plan gets completed it, this is who I am people can can get on the calendar they can come in they can knock on the door we can have conversations always about the direction of the school district and, and our place in the community so I, I want you know I, it's an iterative process and so while it looks formally closed off on paper it's quite honestly not closed off you know that it, the work never stops um, so you know, I just wanted to reiterate our process for people who hadn't really seen the first couple of documents. I wanted you all in the community to understand the data collection process, which I did put in the original plan. Um, what I uh, beefed up in this version of it is just to show you all of the observation time that we've put in as a team and that I've put in um, and the amount of classroom visits that we've done. And, and um, you know, thank you to my coach, Chris McGrath, for going out on visits. I go out on visits with each principal um, as often as possible, and then I also go out um, on my own quite a bit. So I've been in many, many classrooms to get a really good picture and to get some authentic data collected. And then the review of documents, quite honestly, is never ending as well. Um, you know, I'm always working through new documents, new processes that we have in the district. Um, I did a pretty solid qualitative uh, review, and then you'll see the quantitative materials at the end, but my presentation is all qualitative. I wanted to make sure people really understood um, the voice of the community coming through, so that's why I had my bullets as strengths and opportunities for improvement, but then I wanted the quotes in there so that you could really see the voice of the community come out. Um, and again, thank you to the hundreds, well over 200, maybe close to 300 amount of people that, that participated to, at some extent in this process. A lot, a lot of stakeholders. If I've learned anything, Rockport is not a shy community, um, and, and, and there is uh, no shortage of, of people who are willing to share their opinions um, about how we're doing uh, in, in the town in general. So I do, I, I welcome the opinions and I welcome the feedback. 
Um, so we, we had three themes come out, meeting the needs of all learners, academic excellence, college and career readiness. I tried to capture the language of the people who, who uh, participate in the process with me. So that's sort of one big bucket. Second big bucket was around communication, community engagement, climate and culture. And then the third should not surprise you that a lot of comments around facilities and finance. So those were really the three buckets that I analyzed the data through after really combing through all of it. Um, under that first one, uh, you know, with with some outliers and a few exceptions, an unbelievable amount of percentage support across the community, at least the people who participate in this process, for us maintaining our own school district, for us keeping um, a viable educational option within the community. Um, and real, real advocacy for that small district, small town, small school feel. And the majority of the comments talked about the, the positives outweighing the negatives and, and all of that. Um, so that's a big high, uh, high view of theme one. Um, a lot of people believe that the students are presented with well-rounded education, that there's a correlation between student success and our smaller class sizes or our small school feel. Um, that there's a strong core of academic offerings, and obviously the fine and performing arts programs jumped out across the board. Um, so uh, probably since you guys have raised children and been on school committee, uh, nothing monstrously surprising to you, um, I, I would suspect, coming out of that first page. But I think, again, it's, it's sometimes um, nice to hear it reiterated by the masses, so to speak, and to, for, for me as a newbie coming in to get as many people as possible uh, to share those, those thoughts with me. Um, a lot of comments. Some of these, if you see the curriculum comments, those came out of my walkthroughs and those com came out of the review of documents. So clearly that's not stakeholder feedback. It could be teacher feedback, I suppose, but in generally speaking, that's a lot of the, the review of documents. So um, we've done a lot of work already this year to take a look at our curriculum documents, and by that I mean our instructional support documents, or our curriculum maps, our scope and sequence, how we articulate what we do and why we do it on the page. There's a really rich history of that in this district, um, but it's in different pockets and in different styles. Um, and I suppose that is just reflective of changes over time in leadership, would be my guess. Um, so we, I have worked um, quite a bit with the content leaders, curriculum leaders across the district. Really, really great group of teacher leaders who are invested in doing this work. Um, so right now we're doing a, a, a big overview of our current curriculum documents, and then moving into year two, we're gonna have some agreed upon processes and uh, for every for every content area and grade level um, that will really allow us to do a, a much better job when we do curriculum review and adoption. Um, but in general, the, um, the district really does value systemic, purposeful, and structured learning experiences. So, you know, you're only as good as your instructional practices is what all of this data comes out to say. So our curriculum on the page is one thing, but how it's executed in the classroom can, can really be, be the measure of success for us. Um, so we're taking a look at instructional practices over the next couple of years as well as um, how, we, how we document what we do. Um, the second criteria uh, under each theme has been opportunities for inquiry and growth. This is a, the critical lens. I think this is where many people would like to pause, right, and take a look at what um, I think and what the community thinks. Um, so we talked about already that first bullet of developing and implementing a more structured way to, to review. Um, some of that has already started, as you know, through the budget approval process, taking a look at engineering, computer science, and biomed. Um, there were lots of opinions around world language uh, that came out of my, my entry planning work. Some of this is related to small schools. Some of it might have been related to historical budget. Um, it could, some of it could just be supply and demand when you don't have more than 50 or 60 kids in a grade level sometimes. Um, so those are conversations I will continue to have with principals and the World Language Department. Can we leverage technology? Can we leverage partnerships? Can we leverage different ways to provide students unique opportunities to potentially study more world languages or just a different world language than the one that the district is currently invested in? Um, so that, that's a longer conversation that we'll do. Um, and as Principal Rose already presented, we've already had good conversations about starting to annually review in a really robust way our high school electives and make sure they're meaningful, they're connected to the world authentically, um, and that we're not sort of rolling the ball out consistently every year and doing the same thing. Um, so what's nice is that I'm presenting this after the budget and this late in the game that some of the work has already started, right? And so it's, um, it's, it's nice to see it all kind of dovetail together. Um, and a lot of literacy work at the bottom of page six. Uh, we, we just partnered, um, we have partnered, sorry, with Lead for Literacy. 
Um, we are also working with Brent Conway, who is a uh, state and national leader in reading, also assistant superintendent locally at Pentucket. So he came in and just gave um, a, a, a really well-received professional development to our entire elementary staff and to the middle school special ed team and English language arts team last week. Um, and so then we're going to be looking to partner with Keys to Literacy as well and really take a hard look at our kindergarten through eighth grade literacy programming. Um, and we are sitting on our hands waiting for a DESI grant uh, to come through. And if we are fortunate enough to get the grant, um, then I'll have a lot of really nice updates for you before the end of the year as far as some of the work we can do um, around literacy development. I think we're going to see the fruits of our labor pretty quickly around math. Prior to me getting here, as you probably know, there was an adoption of new elementary middle school mathematics programming that did come with professional development and with some shifts. Um, I think we see a little of that already in this year's MCAS data, and I do suspect that every year that you do this work, you see more gains. Um, so it, it will take time to do that work, uh, but our current students will benefit in real time over the next one, two, three years of that implementation and that work. And I see it in the classrooms when I go in. I see kids engaged in doing math and in problem solving and in connecting, them, particularly at the middle school, and connecting the math to the real world, um, which is not always the case in, in some math programs. Um, so I do think we're going we're gonna to see the benefits of that. Um, you'll see some comments in here around special education and around our percentage um, and how we're a little higher than the state. Um, so we'll talk more as a special ed team about our pre-referral and regular education supports and our intervention programming, our pre-referral process, and what are we doing through an MTSS process and what are we doing for students um, who are not instantly identified with a disability at a young age, but those who sometimes for lack of a better term, slip through the cracks or go through a system and then the system itself um, doesn't meet their needs fast enough that they wind up in a referral process. Um, so the, many districts are wrestling with that work right now. It, it's, it's a big, big lift at the elementary school that we need to take a look at um, and make sure that we're giving Tier 1 instructional supports and Tier 2 supports to students of all, um, of all types of needs. And um, the last bullet, and then I'll stop and let you hit me on the first theme. Um, very carefully written uh, on my part, so I want you to make sure you read that last bullet carefully on page seven. I think there's a big opportunity to define academic rigor. If I ask 20 people, educators or non-educators, what that really means, I suspect, and I, if I could share the answers more transparently, I got 20 different answers. So a lot of people have an opinion on rigor. A lot of people think it isn't rigorous enough. It is rigorous. Some people think burying kids with six hours of homework equals rigor. Failing a third of your kids equals rigor. Um, there's, it's all over the place. Um, having more kids in APs, having less kids in APs, um, having seven levels of math. Every, I, I can't tell you the wide variety of definitions on this. We have an opportunity as a school district to look at the research, to look at the best practice definitions, and for us to control that message. And that's the work we'll do next year together as a school district to decide how we are defining academic rigor in Rockport. And then we will report that out to the community and let the community know how we think we're doing in that aspect. Um, a shockingly wide variety of opinions on this particular topic. Yeah. Um, so I will, I will stop and let you guys talk about theme one if you'd like. Well, it's not surprising you have such a variety of opinions because when you don't define your terms, it makes it, um, you know, the definition of anyone who cares to make it and what's success and what's failure. So it's great to hear that that exercise will go forward because <laughs> I think that helps clarify the discussion. I think two quick thoughts that I have when I see this. One is um, when we went through our process and our public polling, our three public polls of um, internal staff, the public, and parents, what we got as results from there, either positive or room for improvement, really match what you're getting here. So one of the things I think is reassuring about that is the themes that we captured and kind of considered in looking for a candidate for a new superintendent, um, they're really being validated here by what um, folks are giving you in terms of responses. And I, I love the fact, similar to those polls, where you haven't sugar-coated, you might have um, more politely expressed what you got, but not sugar-coated where there might be an opportunity for a renewed effort. And I think that reminds me a great deal of um, a 360-degree review where you compare your own perceptions of yourself, in this case the school district, to the perceptions that the people who report to you and the people who 
um, you report to have of yourself. So in this case, it would be more like the parents and public's version. And in some cases, I know you reached out to the students as well to get their impression. And what that necessarily yields is not an unqualified thumbs up. And that's great because what you don't want is consistently positive news because you're not getting at the things that perhaps need a little more vigor, a little more encouragement, a few more resources. So I'm, I'm really pleased that the content of this and how you've distilled it down into actionable um, items that as we move through the report and as we get to that last period of implementation, you know, I can see how this will set that up for success. I had a couple questions about the analysis of your data. Yep. <clears throat> so even though I know it's a qualitative report, did you do any sort of um, tally or rankings of some of these findings? So for instance, when, it, when you look at the strengths, were there, like, could you say what were the top five ones? And same with the, the weaknesses. Could you identify the top five of those? I can. Yeah. Um, I, so I did a two-cycle coding is what I really did. Um, so, and that, which is explained on that first page, but the easier way to explain that is basically that's the first thing you do is you code all the information by amount of responses in question one, question two, question three, question four, question five. Then you go back and you look at that bucket of responses and you try to come up with some kind of secondary coding system. And for me, those were these three themes that came out. So I do have that information. Um, it, has, it has been um, my experience doing um, data analysis in a lot of different formats now to not present it in that manner. Um, and to, I, I thought about alphabetizing it. I thought about um, organizing it by um, topical area. And, and in, in general, um, the safest way to present the data actually is in uh, kind of a non-hierarchical format. Um, Why? I think because um, just because 15 people said it doesn't actually mean that's fully factual. It means the most people believed it. It's my job and the leadership's team job to figure out where the facts are. And so I might share that information with the leadership team. Hey, okay. what you need to know is this many people in the, in the community believe X. Well, that's not it. You need to know that. As is the case with with um, defining rigor, perception can be reality if you haven't cleaned that up, right? Sure. So that's really the reason is because it do doesn't necessarily mean it's true all the time. And, and what I'm presenting to you is my best analysis of the data as factually as possible. Um, yep. So then <clears throat> this might be sort of a repeat question then. Yep. <clears throat> with some of the um, the findings... Did you notice um, the different stakeholders sort of falling in different buckets, I guess, in yes. terms of their responses? Yes. And again, how come or could you report out on that or, or not? Uh, then it's not anonymous. If I, if I reported out that all teachers... Just because of the that. numbers who were involved, it would be... Well, just because the minute I clarify that as educator versus parent, people are going to have an opinion on that. Um, and, and it's not about the opinion, it's really about the data and what we're, so th the, point of the, the point of the process is to collect the data, to analyze it, and actually get to the strategy for district improvement. So if we do our job well, yeah. we'll develop a strategy for district improvement, and you're going to look at that and go, oh, those okay. are the four most important things. So this is the sort of the midway this point. This tees that up. Yeah, yeah. It, I, I suspect, and I've been through this as an assistant superintendent with a very skilled superintendent in another district who did this. Um, I was fortunate to basically be with him when he went through the exact same thing I'm going through now. And um, it was eye-opening once the strategy was in the community, the internal and external stakeholders looked at the strategy, and it was so clear that these are the four or five or six areas. So you have the information, and yes. you'll use that information yes. to report out yes. later. This is the sanitized public version. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else on oops, anybody else on theme one? So when we get to theme two, this is around community 
communication, community engagement, climate and culture. Uh, no surprise, right, that the next two themes have much shorter feedback. <laughs> if you look at them, like it's only a page or so on each one of them. So clearly the community was very vocal um, and wanted to really share their thoughts on that first major theme, which is why that, that had so much information. Um, I, I like some of the big quotes. I've always felt that I could reach out to anyone there. Um, they've done a nice job nurturing a sense of community and caring for our children. Um, one of the strengths is creating a safe and caring environment. Um, and these quotes did, just to help um, you understand this a little more, Mr. Lorenz, some of these quotes I purposely pulled from different buckets of stakeholders. So the big quotes do not just over-represent just the teachers or just parents. Or, um, so I was really strategic um, in some of the quotes that I chose. Um, but some, some important stuff comes out here, right, that there are in general, and again, these are overarching larger percentage bullets. So if you see it as a strength, that means a greater percentage of people um, sort of believed in the statement that I crafted. So a real belief that the, uh, Rockport's a community where personal connections and relationships are valued. Um, the co-op athletic programs, I think this is a nice one, bot second bullet from the bottom, are a solid example of the positive impact of developing partnerships with other communities and districts. So I think the takeaway for me there is, hey, if we can do it well in athletics, we should be able to do it well in other ways. Mm -hmm. We should be able to partner with other districts and communities around academic stuff, around transportation, around whatever, field trips, uh, extended learning opportunities for students, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it was interesting that this, this person held that up as, hey, here's a good example, Superintendent Branco. Um, learn from the example that you already have, right? And that's why I really thought, I, I almost took that one. As, a lot of these bullets are, are my um, interpretations overall, but I, some of these are almost direct, um, and I felt that that was a pretty strong one. Um, again, small be uh, strong belief that the small school environment leads to a high sense of belonging among students and staff, and that meaningful relationships do matter. Um, a lot of people that I talked to, even people who moved to Rockport either after raising their children or moved here when their children were already middle school, high school, um, really had an, or people who went to large high schools in larger communities, had a real sense of connection between the schools, uh, staff and students, and a real belief that um, while people have lots of <laughs> Lots of opinions of what we should and shouldn't do from a financial standpoint and an operational standpoint. The great majority believed in, in the small school field and the, and the value of the connections. Um, almost interestingly juxtaposed to <laughs> the message we get financially sometimes, right. um, which I find fascinating. I, that's, you know, that's a down-the-middle analysis right there. Um, opportunities for growth in this area um, would be to leverage its proud and successful alumni. I think this is a great one. I don't know that any school district does this well, but I, I, th this, this was many more than one people gave me this kind of feedback. We have proud alumni who come out of here and who can say definitively that they did go to college or career prepared. And for everybody who says that's not the case, there's a much larger percentage of alumni who believe that they were set up well in their experience here, um, poised them to get off the island, so to speak, and to go out and impact the world and, and be college and career ready. And how do we leverage uh, that proud group of alumni to come back and, ex and, and let our community and let our students know the value of getting a Rockport public school education. I thought that was, that I did put that purposely at the top because um, I really wanted people to notice that one. Um, can we continue to explore and develop partnerships with other schools and districts and organizations that will allow us to expand and improve our course offerings and educational experience? and to, to really make sure that we're providing students with a wide range of learning experiences. We have technology that we can do this with. We own our own mini buses that we can do this with. Um, and I am starting to, uh, to get my, my network um, better expanded on the North Shore. And so as, as I become better connected as a superintendent, that will only benefit us as a school district as well. So I, I, that's going to be an ongoing uh, project of ours as, as a leadership team. Keep a focus on parent involvement. Um, there were mixed opinions on, um, and this is one of the reasons to not break it out, Mr. Lorenz, by, by stakeholder or by school. There were mixed opinions from the parent base around um, at what level parents feel more involved or actually are more involved. Um, and then there were mixed op opinions on whether it was appropriate for them to be over or under involved at certain grade levels. So um, my clean way of of putting that out there is keep a focus on parent involvement um, and, and letting the district, along with the help of the community, kind of define where that's appropriately placed and how, how, to, how to do that well. 
Um, they are your children, <laughs> and we have to remember that at all times, and we want to make sure that we're, it takes a village and that we're partnering with families um, around best interest of kids. Um, so that kind of came out. And then working to attract the best candidates. So we need to put a strong emphasis on recruiting, hiring, and maintaining. And I've said this in lots of forums, so if I'm repeating myself on, for the public, I apologize. But, you know, when I was down in the Merrimack Valley, if you needed a third-grade teacher, you could throw that net out there and you'd literally get 100 resumes. Um, and because of our geographical location, it's different, right? So we need to make sure we put Rockport on the map and we make it a desirable place to come to work every day. We want educators to know that we want to be innovative, that we have a small, caring community of learners here, and that if you come here, you're going to be um, really respected and you're going to be able to kind of fly in the direction you want to fly as a professional. And so, we're, you know, adding a LinkedIn profile, cleaning up our website, little things like that are one, but we also have our own staff members advocating. So as we put out um, the posting for a chorus teacher, um, Nathan Cohen went out to the Mass Music Educators Conference just a week ago. He went with a stack of those in his hand. So our, our educators are our best recruiting tool sometimes. Um, so we want the people who are really happy and doing great work here in Rockport to tell their peers and colleagues in other places, hey, come here, come work with us. Um, and that came out pretty loud and clear, too, in, in some of the data. So any thoughts on theme two? So facilities and finance. <laughs> um, a lot of conversation <laughs> about the buildings. Um, not sure who, you know, if what people's criteria are to give us th that feedback. Um, but, you know, lots of, right, there could be people with lots of credentials and others like me who, you know, have to hire someone to do everything. Um, so, but in general, the generalization is we need to continue to maintain our buildings. We want to treat our buildings no differently than your house. We wouldn't let the four walls of your house fall down, your roof fall in. So the big push for preventative maintenance, um, which is, I don't want to skip ahead, but I will when you see the opportunities. You'll see that, you know, Kirk and I had had conversations about the importance of putting together some kind of long-range plan uh, to really make sure that we are strategically uh, taking care of, of our buildings. We only have two, but we have a nice campus, and we have fields, and we have ancillary um, small structures as well, that, um, including playgrounds and, and tennis courts and stuff like that that we really need to take good care of. Um, and uh, the list under strengths is just, it's probably much longer, but I asked Kirk to just to give us an authentic list so that we can really see and put that out for the committee and the community to see. Like, th there's been a lot of work um, that continues to be ongoing. Um, around around the facilities. Um, I think we do provide adequate classroom space, functional gymnasiums and libraries, but that's a very carefully worded statement too. Adequate is not what I'm aiming for, um, and I don't think that's what I'd want for my own kids, nor, nor do we want that for our kids. So we want to offer um, the highest quality facilities that we can um, at all time. And um, just a comment about budget that you all know that historically the budget's been developed in a certain manner. Um, and that direct quote, just kind of wrote itself, work to build the budget without an override culture. Um, and that also rang true in a lot of the data that I looked at. People phrased it in a lot of ways, but generally speaking, I, my hope is that the work we've done together this year with the new budget book, with the new process, um, will make the community at least satisfied with the budget process. Might not always be happy with every decision we make within the budget, um, but generally speaking, with the transparency in the process for the community. So. Um, and then you'll see uh, Kirk's kind of list of things that we know we have to look at in the future. Um, and you'll see a statement that you've already been privy to, the, the, the bottom-up transparent collaborative budget work. Um, and then annually review our student enrollment and our staffing levels. This bottom one we've already experienced together as a committee. Um, this is just our way of saying that we agree with the community, um, that we do have to take a look at uh, staffing levels, patterns, programmatic costs, um, and develop a fiscally responsible budget that provides our students everything that they, they need and deserve. Um, but at the same time, that's going to take the leadership team consistently looking at programming and staffing. Um, and, and that might become the new norm is, is, uh, every year, analyzing programming and staffing so that we can do, do right by our students every single day. Um, and that's the end of Section 3 before we go to the quantitative stuff. Any thoughts on that? So I think a lot of what you're saying here is also, you know, we tend to think of our, ourselves as the be-all and end-all, but I think you've done a lot of correlating with what's best practice and mm -hmm. standard practice mm -hmm. throughout the region, throughout the state, mm -hmm. nationally. So, um, you know, 
clearly this year and into ensuing years, we're going to be doing things perhaps in a different way than we have in the past, but that's all a part of, I think, providing that environment that's the best possible offering for our students with the budget we have. And I think what's interesting from my perspective, since I did get to read and everything and talk to everybody I did, that with the exception of some outliers, the general feedback through this process has aligned with that last bullet. The general feedback overall for the, the people who participate in this process do want us to be successful. They do want us to take a hard look at how we do it and why we do it. And then they do want the product to continue to meet the needs of kids. Um, with the exception of a few outliers, that's, that was a pretty strong consensus. Um, and so I think you know, we're well on our way through year one of doing that together, and we'll continue that work. Um, the next section, I won't oh, go through. Could, oh, go I was going to ask a couple ahead. things. It, Reading through this w the first time, the second bullet point on the strengths, the one about the adequate classroom space, yeah. I totally agree with you that um, adequate is not good enough. So to me, that would really be a, a place for more growth, right? right? And then same thing on the growth side, the second bullet point, the bottom-up process for the budgeting. To me, that was a real strength this year. So I almost would have flip-flopped the two, which leads me to my question about do you envision doing something similar to this on sort of an ongoing cycle? So every year, every other year, every three years, and, and I wonder how these bullets will kind of fluctuate after year one. So the strategy for district improvement will be written, th it will be written as a three-year strategic plan. The difference between the way we're trained and, and um, high-performing school districts do the work now versus even 10 years ago or 15 years ago, is that the strategic plan used to be built, presented, literally put in a three-ring binder, put in a shelf, and then you just do it. This one is going to be iterative, electronic, hyperlinked, and it will be a real-time reporting. So the school councils and the leadership team in real time on the back pages of the strategic plan, you will see the community will see the changes in the plan. So even though we call it a three-year plan, my experience in my past district is that plan just remains. And you'll see <clears throat> benchmarks, and you'll see us celebrate successes, and then you'll see those fall kind of into maintenance mode, right. and then you'll see new bullets pop to the top of importance. What's most important is that we identify what we're calling the big rocks, the two, three, or four big rocks that are going to guide our district. Um, those rocks cannot change. No different than our professional development themes that I presented to you. Those themes are not one-shot themes. Those themes are, are going to permeate the work we do in professional development for three, four, yeah. five years. So you won't see this again. You might see surveys again, though. That, yeah, so you, that's yeah, what I was going to I, I think ask I talked about the to data the, collection. Yeah, I actually talked to the chair about um, a colleague of mine in another district in year two started to do principal, uh, similar to what you're all trying to do. He, he did principal forums, principal coffees, um, luncheons. You know, you partner up with different community um, locations and you go out and, and you hold some open-ended kind of like a no agenda Friday kind of a thing like the talk radio stations have right you just go out you have no agenda and you come out and it's just an opportunity to hear from the people and then you do put out some kind of survey every other year or it seems like it would be a really good process to yep. do a similar thing in terms of the the analyzing the data to really see yep. your growth over time yeah and yep. almost use this as a as a baseline report yeah. and, yeah. and to have so the know, this will right turn here. into the strategy the yeah. strategy will become the baseline report right. And you will see through all of our presentations, through our work, you'll see real evidence or lack thereof, depending on the year and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the goal, right? You'll, you'll see it through, through our student growth and achievement, quite honestly, and through our retention of staff or through our transparency with our budgeting and our communication. In theory, we'll be, we as a committee will be able to track that growth for the community tied to the, tied to the plan. So I'm, I'm excited about the plan, and I'm very, very fortunate to have been a superintendent at the exact same time assistant superintendent, sorry, at the same time with someone who was a first year. So I've, I've seen it work. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of itching almost to just jump to that next. You know, this was great because <laughs> um, I needed it. But I'm, as I said to the leadership team, like, I'm almost done collecting history. <laughs> I, I just need to get out of history, and I need to get into now and the future. That's, right. that's where my patients are right now. Um, so I will not go through the quantitative work, Mr. Chair, because it's stuff that you're already privy to in a lot of ways. But, um, you know, uh, five-year scores, I think what I would like you to read is my narrative under the AP data. 
Um, I do think it's important for the community to know, I know the committee knows this, that because we have an open, open enrollment practice at, for AP, um, which might differ from some school districts that have prerequisites for some of these classes, um, including the mass, co comparing to the mass and the global mean score, it's informative, but it really doesn't, the numbers don't show us the impact it has on a child. So what shows us the impact would be some kind of specific student data to his or her or their knowledge base in that subject area pre-AP and post-AP. What they tell us narratively about being prepared for college or not prepared for college. Um, that's more important. It, when, you, when you allow open enrollment and when you have um, access for all and you have equitable processes, which we do for access to courses, the numbers will not prove out in a data sheet the way that some people want them to prove out. So not hitting fours across the board does not mean we don't have good quality AP program. Um, and if I can find a better way to report out growth and achievement in this kind of a model, I promise you I'll try to do it. Um, I would love to talk to my peers in other districts who have an open, remote, open equitable process and figure out how they report it out. Because just to pull the data from the AP test results is, in my opinion, it doesn't do us justice as a school district. And so I've given you all the, that information just so that you know that I looked at it. Same thing with our SAT data. More and more colleges um, are making SAT optional. Big conversations at the state and national level on, on the um, the uh, ability for the SAT to predict uh, college success or career success even um, and, and many colleges are looking at the whole student's portfolio and package and starting to just use SAT for merit scholarship placements and information like that or honors programming at certain universities. Um, so we'll continue to, to work hard on, on this information and um, you know, kind of put it in its rightful place when it comes to analyzing how successful we are. In the MCAS, I've already given that presentation, but we do have um, concerns around literacy and some of our math. We believe that the math program will continue to improve our results there, and we have work to do, particularly uh, at the early level around literacy. Um, and it, as long as that work goes the, the way it's um, currently being designed, we think we'll see that those changes improve over time as well. So that is all I have. Um, I thank, again, I thank the public um, for their participation. It was really important. I heard from so many people, one-on-ones, focus groups, interviews, um, and, and um, really, really important for me to hear this information. And to, your, to many of your points, it's not that we stop listening. We will continue to listen. It's just we need to move forward with designing our strategy next so that um, our strategy informs our practice, that informs our budget, and then it just becomes a cyclical amount of work that we're going to do together. So do we think, I mean, I'm looking at these, some of these last charts. So this is the entry level, or entry level, this is the entry report. Mm -hmm. Are you thinking that on an annual basis we might be receiving some version of this? These, these charts are wonderful. I know at, at times in the huh. past we've really struggled to get sort of a longitudinal right. listing of how we're doing AP-wise. It would seem like... Right. Some aspect of this an annual report would really be helpful right. towards progress against goals. So I actually yeah. told Principal Rose not to do that this year because I knew I was doing this. So what, right. what you will get annually is you will get an update pr probably twice a year, at least from me, on the work on the strategy for district improvement. So once I present the strategy in September or in August, whenever that happens, you'll see the direction that we're laying for the district, and then I'll give you either um, trimesterally or mid and post reporting on all of the goals and the efforts and the work. And then under that, Principal Rose and I started to talk about a, a, f a more comprehensive data presentation from the high school particularly. And then um, we are having another conversation around progress monitoring tomorrow as a leadership team and what tools we are using and aren't using connected to our um, MTSS work um, so that ultimately we'd like to have a culture of progress monitoring first grade all the way through eighth grade, maybe up to freshman year. Um, we have a culture of progress monitoring in, pro in pockets right now. Um, but ultimately, we get to get to a place where we have local, state, and national assessment data on a child. And can that all go into some kind of Google spreadsheet and so that we are tracking kids' progress and growth and connecting those? Because the, a lot of the data does say when you look at, and when I say local data, I'm talking about some kind of nationally normed 
um, assessment that we give in-house, whether that's STARS or MAP or, um, or Galileo, which we're currently using. Right. So we're going to take a look at the products we're using over the summer and, and try to recalibrate on a, on a product. Um, and then our students will be progress monitored at the local level through a product. They get the MCAS, whether we like that or not, as a state determiner. And right. then ultimately some of the nationally normed stuff like AP and SAT. So we'd, I'd like to kind of wrap that all together into yeah. some kind of data presentation in the future. That, that sounds great. And I think the, the part that I really appreciate about this, and it sounds like it will be in future iterations, is in, in the past we've often been given current performance but not necessarily the context, right. which might have a lot of extenuating circumstances, COVID years, et cetera, um, with historical data. But I, yeah. but I think that helps us see trend-wise yeah. what's going on, where do we need to focus more, or it gives you at least the opportunity to respond to, we're seeing this pattern here, don't be alarmed, this is one marker, here's yeah. what we're doing to attend to it. So I think this is really helpful to see in this format as well. So. Before we get off data, I will just say what's very difficult about data like AP and SAT is it's a one shot with one cohort of kids. Right. What's, in my opinion, more meaningful with, with MCAS and nationally normed local progress monitoring data is you can track the child by name over time and you can track the cohort, like the third grade, and then when they're in fourth grade. and the, You can't do that with an AP and an SAT. It's just one, and not every kid takes those. Right. Um, so it's one shot. So yeah. the historical context is important, but there's so many variables from the class of 23 versus the class of 22 versus the class of 21. Um, probably hard, you know, we'll continue to present it, but harder to analyze success over years. Yeah, um, sure. With the growth data and the individual student. What I'd love to do is find a way in an anonymous way for the principal to be able to report out that out of our, you know, 70% uh, of our students took AP or took SATs, and out of that 70%, 66 of them demonstrated growth individually according to X. Right. That would make me feel really good that we could have that some kind of... That sounds good. I, I don't know how we tease that out, but that's the way I'd love to present it to you. <laughs> sure. And not to, not to worry this point, but I, I think the, the value of the longitudinal yep. information is to surface for us. I know for years our AP physics marks right. were a concern, and partially the concern was we weren't teaching to the test in time when the test was taken, right. which, gotcha. you know, this sort of data allows us to say, hey, what's going on right. here and maybe surface it a little yep. bit more efficiently than we yep. had in the past, which yep. is not yep. your worry. But I, I totally hear what you're saying about it's one point in time people yep. become so fixated on a single yep. grade or mark or performance, and what truly is important is whether the individual – student is progressing well and given the, the resources yeah. needed to, to do that. But, but So that sounds great. It sounds like we've got all of this. Yeah, and I think we can do both. If we're yeah. good at it, we'll present both. Sounds good. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Very quiet tonight. So that's really impressive interim report more to come so I think um, we have a couple financial things to yeah, talk about whenever you're ready for those the, the first one is um, we did have a question at our finance committee presentation by a community activist about whether we could sort of summarize all the ESSER monies that came in I know we've been receiving reports um, throughout the year at various meetings, but just sort of an overview was requested, and it seemed like a reasonable request, so I think June has gone ahead and captured it all in one shot. Yes, thank you. Um, so this was per the uh, request of the um, gentleman, and I think it's good to share it with everybody. Uh, the Easter 2 and Easter 3 funds, uh, they're still allowable to be spent, so we have not spent down all the funds yet. But just to give a snapshot of some of the things that we've done with the money is, for example, we paid for an extra custodian during our 21-22 school year. This was back when the children were coming back full time, yet to do that we were doing testing, there was cleaning protocols, uh, packaging of uh, food protocols. Uh, that required additional help that our staff in order to have the children back in full time. So this allowed for that person to be hired 
at no additional cost to the taxpayer, as well as additional cafeteria worker um, for the processing and packaging, special packaging required and delivery system of the, the meals. Um, both of those people are still on staff at not an additional cost to the taxpayer. It's due to the fact that there were retirements after that, so we were allowed to retain those people, but at no additional cost. Um, in the summer of 2021, we needed to have run a summer recovery program at, for the elementary, middle, and high. These are for students who normally don't qualify for our special ed summer services or at the elementary level, our Title I services. So we were allowed to set up programs and target these um, at-risk academic uh, children that really felt the effects of the pandemic and we were allowed to run a, a summer program at all three school levels. They were designated, we had staff, and we also had directors. Um, there was a cost for that. We had um, some allowable out of district tuitions. There was a fraction of the grant that was allowed to charge off, so that allows our circuit breaker reserve to remain a little bit higher than it would have been if we weren't allowed to use these funds. We didn't abuse that uh, privilege. Um, as you can see, we only used 66,000, but I think it was a good compromise of using those that opportunity. The cafeteria, as I said, needed special packaging and delivery carts and warming. Uh, we were able to pay for those. Uh, obviously, the carts and the warming center at the elementary is still in use, so we have legs on that. Uh, our current math curriculum that was uh, talked about in the entry plan, that was paid fully by ESER funds. So it cost the district nothing to um, implement a huge new curriculum with online and in um, paper in traditional ways of um, teaching. We were allowed to get a couple of new smart boards um, for at the elementary level. And then uh, for those two years that you saw those huge tents outside um, in the front and the back of the uh, middle school, high school building, um, those cost quite a bit to get those kind of tents. It was very challenging to get those and those were paid fully by um, these funds. So we were allowed to have outdoor eating, uh, graduation one year, plays, classrooms, and as well as town meeting was even held with the, those tents. Mm -hmm. So the did not cost the school budget anything. Um, that was really with the ESER 2 funds, and then ESER 3 came along, which was significantly bigger, and it had a more targeted use. It needs to focus more on the education piece. We're now moving away from the uh, COVID aspect of um, PPE and cleaning and whatnot, and now this is more the educational piece. So with the ESER 3 funds so far, we were the first year back, we were allowed to bring in quite a few acceleration spe specialists and an additional counselor uh, and run, run a whole recovery program. And then that required a director to oversee that program and that was paid with those funds. We needed an additional nurse to assist with all our COVID protocols and additional medical needs of our students. And then we had, um, we determined we had a need for a part-time elementary trauma counselor for a period of time in the elementary school. And the grant afforded us to have a person come in for, oh, I'd say three days a week. Was that correct, Mark? Mm -hmm. um, we were also allowed to get some more assessment, online assessment tools for math, literacy, and just overall student assessment that got to be paid by the grant. And we did, uh, be able to run some after school programming and a little more support with those funds. And then a larger one that you will notice is the, it's called MTRS contribution of $56,000. That's, uh, I can say that's the downside of using federal funds for salaries. We're required to contribute to the um, retirement systems of your state, uh, a certain percentage. That does not offset the towns contribution in any way or the employer employee or the employer side it's just required of the federal government to contribute that amount um, and we were able to do that with the grant we do have um, funds remaining and I'm happy to say that I feel we will be able to fully fund um, project lead away with grant funds and hopefully after that there will be a certain amount I do not have um, exact amount for you 
at this time, but we will be able to be able to contribute to any literacy curriculum uh, above and beyond the 40,000. And of course, we'll draw from the grant first before we um, you know, touch that 40,000 that we have set aside in the budget. So I did just sign uh, the Project Lead the Way contract today, so that's good news to hear. Um, so <laughs> the hope is we'll be able to fully fund that. Um, and then if, if, um, if the literacy grant, the way it's written, comes in at a certain percentage to cover our needs, then the hope is that we can exhaust the remaining ESSER funds to cover that. So again, I, I just think it's good examples for the taxpayers for the, of the district um, trying to do right by the district and by the community um, with federal and state funds that come in. So uh, thank you for the overview. I thank the, I thank the community member who asked. I think it's important that we can put this information out there. And I think, you know, the complexity of the school budget, as the ESSER money started, consistently people who were not spending their um, their <laughs> vacation hours studying the school budget were very confused about, well, you, you just got a bumper, a car just backed up and gave you 640 grand, right. so why do we have to have an override? And even though we tried to broadcast the message of, think of this as a catch-up bottle, this is to catch up from the impact of the pandemic. It is not a blank checkbook where June can buy anything she wants and <laughs> She does not budget for tents on a regular basis. <laughs> so it's really nice to see this synopsized in one sheet because it's understandably difficult for the casual observer to keep it in mind. But here's sort of a, and, and so that's why that community member I think asked, I think he actually knew the answer, mm -hmm. but just thought that there should be a final formal accounting and it allows us to simply point to it and say, no, no, we don't have an extra three quarters of a million dollars just hanging around for discretionary purchases. It's very targeted. So great I, job. I really guys. enjoy that we're um, able to use these funds now for curriculum because yeah. curriculum, it's not a one and done. The tent was necessary. It's one and done. And we don't even own the tent. Right. Um, but you do a curriculum, you're getting four, five, six, seven, eight years out of something. Um, it has legs long after that money's gone. And right. it gives you time to prepare to either, if it's working, to analyze the budget to go forward and set the money aside to renew, or it also allows you that time to really study it with no financial pressure on the district to then decide, do we need to go in a different direction? It just, it, it's a, it's a, it has legs and it gives you that feeling of freedom to make really good choices with strong analysis that you well, wouldn't have without that, right. for those, that funding. Well, it acknowledges the fact that the minute we decided COVID was over, it didn't mean that the impact on kids immediately lifted, the sort of falling behind or struggling to keep on what would normally be a peer level for some most it takes time to recover from that. It may take years to recover from right. that. Right. I think I think Rockport was really good in using earlier funds called, uh, called CARES Act, and there was uh, smaller, real smaller technology ones that when you were in the moment of the pandemic, we could use those funds for the, like you said, we were in the pandemic, so we need masks, we need cleaning, we need equipment to spray rooms, we need... Um, uh, more one-to-one -on -one devices immediately. We need some online software to fill in the blanks. So it's almost like a panic, educated panic shopping. And we use those funds wisely, but like you said, what's the fallout of the pandemic? And I think now we were able to use these funds for the fallout, and the fallout is really the direct impact on the children. Any other um, comments or concerns or questions? So that would move us to the private OOD tuition. So just an up, oops, again. Just an, <laughs> just an update for uh, the committee. Um, I guess as June likes to tell me, no no big shocker here that every one of our um, <laughs> private uh, placement programs is going to take advantage of the fourteen percent hike. Um, you know, so it, it's just you know, so that um, this this is presented very carefully. Um, so what you're seeing here is, you know, you don't see you don't see names, you don't see disabilities, you don't see a lot of historical data. Uh, I, but I, I I tried to pull out anything identifiable, and just show you um, the the real numbers. Um, so basically, you can see what one um, out of district tuition at each one of these is. One of those particular schools is two tuitions. Um, doesn't matter which one, but one of them is. 
and then um, that's the, the comp number from 23 to 24. And as you can see, it's a 14% increase across the board for every one of them, which jumps our number from just over a million to a uh, million to five. Um, and so we, we also do anticipate, and I know you've heard this from every other person who sat in my seat and every other um, special ed person that you've heard from, that it is, um, there's an ebb and flow to this. So we could have a student age out, we could have another student come in. Um, so these are, these are numbers are today's numbers. Um, but you you know this as well as anybody in the community that you know that the numbers could fluctuate, um, and they often don't fluctuate down for a long period of time. Right. They will, they will, but then. Um, yeah, but I'll they, be honest, get, it's not going to. Right. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. I will say about these numbers that was a snapshot in time of that day. Who who is here and what the impact is going forward? Um, I wish I didn't have to say I told you so. <laughs> that was the one thing I really wanted to be wrong. Um, I should say with those two numbers, it doesn't reflect that two students need um, extensive one-on-one -on -one aids in, up above. That isn't reflected in that number, but also would be part of the package, which also would have a 14% impact because it's the full picture of from that private school. They're allowed to go up. It's not this piece, only this piece, this piece. It's the whole package. And I do know of... Um, I guaranteed at least two other additional outplacements coming. Um, that's why in the budget, when we said the the impact of the 14% was going to be 200,000 and not the 153, 153 that you see right now, um, there were four that were questionable. I can guarantee that there's two. Um, with the two, we're still in process. Um, it's above my knowledge of what the process where they are in that process and if what will happen but that 200,000 that we projected that that 14 percent is effect is 100 percent going to happen so, yeah. so I think what's really important is just for us as a committee to know that when public engages us in these kind of conversations that these numbers that we presented through the budget are right there they're conservative but they're right there um there's there's no in, you know there's no inflation in a number. No. Um, it's not like we're looking for to hold hundred thousand dollars over here just in case. Um, we've crafted a really tight budget that is fully reflective of our needs right now. Right. Um, and as you know, in this particular subset of budget, um, things change rapidly sometimes. So um, I'll continue to give you updates. You know, if we hear good news from the legislature, if we hear something change, if we hear about pothole money, um, if the advocacy work across the state has any impact. You know, we'll know about it th when, when the budget finally gets adopted. Um, but right now, um, I, I think our budget is positioned to support the needs of the district, and we just kind of right. keep waiting for more info to come. I would say as of today, um, I was in a meeting all day with MASBO, which is my equivalent of MASS and MASC. Uh, we did have a report from the state, and they really weren't addressing our, our needs and requests from all three of our groups regarding this 14%. It's, yeah. It seems to not be so far their priority. Um, their priority right now was leaning towards um, assuring us that they were, even though there's a shortfall on the school lunch, free school lunch for everyone for this year, there's a shortfall of 60 something million dollars that they are funding it through the rest of the year and that in a supplemental budget uh, vote that the House, the Senate, and the Governor seem to all be on the same page for uh, wanting to have free breakfast and lunch for next year. We are only one of five states in the country that are doing it this year. So we may, it's very rare and it isn't to not appreciate the state for doing that. I think that's tremendous and the value of having um, Kids, children that aren't hungry, which affects learning tremendously, or the worry of the family of how to feed their children. Yeah, um, I get why that is a focus from political and the right thing to do. I just, I hope that they will also listen to this from a budgetary portion of what we can provide at the town level for our children, that they will really take seriously our 14% worry that this is a huge impact. Well, and I think the same activist who had requested your prior document for the ESSER funds, I mean, you should also um, be reassured that in the Mary Bork 
report that you gave earlier, there are active efforts to try and raise the visibility and the, the hope that somehow we'll buffer this 14% with more funding. But I, I think you're right. If you're a legislator and you have a choice between that or food uncertainty, you try and address the yeah. former first. Or the latter That's first. correct. Um, Masbo does have lobbyists that we contract with as well as like you, your groups do. We have committees that are very, very active at the state yep. level and have the ear of Desi, the governor, and all the subcommittees. And um, hopefully there'll be some realization that this could be addressed as well. So we'll continue to give updates on this number um, and the impact of it as, as time goes on. Remind me, um, is this transportation as well or just the programs? Just the programs. Um, that's individual negotiations with each transportation company. Also, this does not reflect um, in state schools. For example, if you had sent, if we are sending our child to a child to Beverly, Danvers, Gloucester, wherever, because they have a specific program already in place because they have enough student population that has this disability, oh. um, that we would send them there. It does the fourteen percent did not apply to them? Did not apply to our local collaboratives that we're members of, or um, any legal agreements, private legal agreements. Those those aren't affected now because they went up fourteen percent here don't expect a 2% from the others. This is their opportunity to yeah. probably get more than a standard and um, or just following inflation, they're going to get a, a significant. We did budget more of an 8% at that level okay. across the board for those other types, including transportation. So I think that would move us to the um, budget update for the Board of Selectmen and FinCon presentations. So really, Mr. Chair, I just put this in so you and I could reiterate to the committee. And, uh, so that I could reiterate to the, the committee and the public that um, thank you to the Board of Selectmen for a 5 support and to the FinCon for, I believe it was an 8 support. Um, and uh, I, I felt that both of those groups um, had great questions and um, recognized our process and our attempt to be transparent and honest with the community and um, look forward to going to town meeting on April 1st. Yeah. And I think, because I think we were all there for perhaps both meetings, actually. Uh, I it was think tough it, for me to tell who was on screen or wasn't. Yeah, no, it is, it is, <laughs> so, especially if you're No presenting. disrespect if you were there and I didn't no, know it. No. <laughs> but I think one of the things I took away from both meetings is it's a you know, it takes a village. It's a tremendously supportive group of committees yeah. that are charged with um, reviewing and connecting with us in terms of presenting the budget, and particularly with the finance committee. I mean, it was really reassuring, and it's kind of a, a pattern now that's been emerging over the last couple of years where, you know, they, they really see us as partners mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, stewardship of, of resources in the town rather than an adversarial, accusational mm -hmm. um, review. And that, that's really encouraging because I think, you know, in the end, we're one town, it's one budget, and it's one community we're trying to build and support. So I was really encouraged by the interactions. And I think the budget book, the new budget book, really helped set up and support that sort of a conversation because you know, in a format that was very reminiscent of a corporate annual report, it outlined the information in a way that many of those members were used to seeing it in their outside lives. So it felt in addition to the traditional transparency that our budgets have, it was easily digestible and sort of the, the context setting questions that we've often gotten in years past, mm -hmm. I think that book really handled in terms of inflows and outflows and really the only questioning that I remember from the Finance Committee of any duration came from the public relative to the ESSER funds looking for a summation. So now we have that available to anyone who's interested prior to town meeting. So that, I, I felt that was very encouraging. I don't know if the rest of you felt like that very straightforward sort of review process and approval. Well, that would move us then to school committee discussion. I know Nicole you were going to give us an update on your Meet the Public Meet the Public session. Um, 
So I'm sorry this is taking a little bit. Um, the person I was working with on this at the library, I guess, is no longer at the library. So Brian Adano from the library was nice enough to get us on the calendar um, for next Tuesday. So I think Mark and Colleen had said that they wanted to come um, next Tuesday from 5 to 6.30. And he reserved this room for us, um, the Brenner Room, which is really nice. Um, and then I am going to be uh, going um, next Friday at 11 a.m. is when the the uh, <clears throat> the music program for the kids kind of gets out. So the children's librarian had said that she thought it would be a good idea if we could have one then. So if there's parents who maybe don't even have kids yet in the system, that they could ask questions about the school, talk about the budget, sort of talk about anything school related. So if anyone is available or might want to join me. Um, <laughs> I know it's when was kind of in the middle of the day, so it's Friday at 11 a.m. Um, this Friday or this Friday? Next, next Friday. Friday. And um, Brian is also going to, Kathy made a nice little picture of the library with a picture of the budget booklet superimposed on it, so he said that he would kindly um, push that out on the library social media um, for us, so that was... That was great, and I don't know what our process is for pushing something like that out. If you want to send it to me, we could probably have Mike Montgomery put that out now on all the platforms if you wanted to. Yep. Great. All right, so that should be, and hopefully, and I don't know if we want to, if it was a snowstorm day at Brothers Brew, if we feel like we it's worth try doing it again, but we can talk about that. Maybe we'll see what happens with our <laughs> library um, times, and we'll see. But Ross was very was, open to, to having us you do an announcement about the Tuesday one here in the library? I don't know. How did you do it last time? Facebook? Um, we, Ross actually did it he for did. us. So the library is going to push it out on their social media. For the Tuesday one. Mm -hmm. For the Tuesday okay. one and the Friday one. We're putting on the website for that too? Yeah, any, anything yeah. you send me, I can get out. I'll send that. Yep. Yeah. Because yep. you don't mind if so. you have something. Yeah, there's a, there's a picture so I can send that over. So, um, And that is that. Hopefully we have a huge crowd. <laughs> Were there any other um, items the school committee wanted to bring up or discuss? Okay. Is there a need for executive session? There is not. Do I have a motion to adjourn the March 15th Blackboard School Committee session? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Josh. You're, you're a part of everyone, of course. But. <laughs> <laughs>